we're all emotional eaters, right? Like we all eat with some level of emotion, whether it's we're sitting at the table as a family to have a meal and like we're enjoying some family time or we're unhappy and we're eating, you know, whatever it is, emotions are involved often with activities of our life in general. People's blood glucose numbers on by day two, three, and four are just plummeting. They're coming down, whether they're living with type two diabetes, type one diabetes, if they're injecting insulin, they're using much less insulin at the end of four days. Hi, <laughs> Lauren, you are, you woke up to this beautiful scene. I loved that you shared that photo with me. It was so beautiful. You woke up to a beautiful winter wonderland today. Yes. Not everyone may agree with this, but the snow is quite beautiful when it covers all the brownness um, underneath it. But, but yeah, here in Minnesota, we're having a, a weird winter where um, people are just shedding their tears of sadness because their winter sports are just having a real bad season and there's just been no snow. And what one inch, I think, uh, was what we were thinking here in St. Paul. And it looks more like six and seven. And then we had blue sky. So it's beautiful. And I have to say, I kind of like it. It's sparkling and fresh. And, um, you know, if, if you hate winter, you you tell yourself you hate winter and you're going to hate winter. But if you start to embrace it a little bit, like I did some snowshoeing a few years ago and just things like that, like keeping yourself busy. And now I'm looking to try to ski again and, now things like that with winter, it's really not so bad. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it's all that that mindset is so it's so valuable for so many things. And and you know, you're right. If you say you're going to hate something, then you're going to hate it. Like it, you will. You know what you say out loud, especially, can really become true. So <laughs> I get yeah. that. And interesting, interesting how you put that because we're going to talk a bit about our perception of mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. our perception of life with diabetes, mm -hmm. starting with the big C word as in carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Our favorite word here at Mastering Diabetes. <laughs> um, yeah, How it's scary true. are they? Yeah. How scary are they? Good question. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's so funny because, um, you know, it's such a, it is a mindset. It's a perception when we start to unwrap and unravel the truth behind carbohydrates and what that, what they are, wh how they serve our body, what that all means. We're going to talk about that today so that we can, you know, maybe, look at some of our perceptions around things like fruits. And I mean, last week we were talking about mangoes, <laughs> you know, and if that made anybody cringe to think about eating all those mangoes, if you're living, if you're somebody living with diabetes, um, hopefully that didn't make you cringe, but hopefully, um, you know, we can help to uh, offer some insight as to why carbohydrates from fruit, from whole foods is really the best support for your body, for your whole body, right? Whether or not you live with diabetes, it's such a great support for whole body wellness, for um, optimal um, fuel source. There's just so many things that we can talk about. Um, and for microbiome, like all the things. So um, we're definitely going to get into that. And I think today is kind of a, a little bit of a myth busting perception of things, um, helping to heal what you have defined, Lauren, as carb phobia, which I love that term. And I think we can dive deep into that, you know, the fear of carbohydrates for, and specifically, again, we're going to almost like, we can almost dive into just the fear of fruit, which we were just having a conversation about, you know, that there's a general perception out there that fruit is somehow equal to sugar and is therefore bad for us, you know, um, you were telling us, you know, tell that story that you were telling me about the um, community center. Yeah, I will. I will tell you the listeners about an interesting conversation I had the other night, and what you said, Kylie, just now about um, nourishment. It's all of these healthy foods and carbohydrates that we are absorbing. All these, all this great nutrition from vitamins and minerals and all the things that power our body. What's healthy for diabetes is healthy for the whole system. What's healthy for the whole system is healthy for diabetes. Diabetes has been treated singularly with this horrible phrase, I'm putting it in quotes, is the diabetic diet, which is such a bad word. Um, and still seeing that there's a prescription for us, for people with diabetes that we're supposed to follow as if we're just going to fix the diabetes part and make it look like your glucose isn't moving, but everything else could potentially suffer like the heart, like the cardiovascular system, like the kidneys, mental health. And there's evidence of, of that going on. 
because we're not treating the whole system historically, right? We, we have evidence of doing exactly the opposite clinically than what clearly the mastering diabetes recommendations are really help to treat the whole body. And certainly there's flexibility within that, but um, yes. I, so with that said, interestingly, interestingly enough, in a community center here where I teach indoor cycling classes, we had this great idea to do blue zone showings because they have a theater. And so of course someone, you know, we pull up Netflix and we're just, we're just going to show them. So one of four, it's been really great. There's been a, a range of different types of people that have come a range of ages. So they all have different reasons for wanting to see it. And we pitched it as, um, Hey, you'll get to have a little discussion with me afterwards. I was going to present, here's what we're going to, we're, we're going to Costa Rica today. We're going to learn a little bit about Greece. We're going to head over to Loma Linda today and, and learn these things. And then we'll talk about anything we saw that was really powerful and meaningful to us. What was so beautiful is we were demonstrating a blue zone in the moment as we were together in a community as we were, you know, people were sitting in partnership with each other. We were creating friendships and, um, in fact, I saw someone there who I have not seen since before COVID in 2019. I had not seen her and I did not know she was a member of the community center. And she came walking in at the end of the showing and just, you know, Lauren, I was like, oh my God, Janet. And I just adore her. And she's a woman of so many hobbies. Yeah. Just so many hobbies and keeps herself busy and super active and all these things. And then she came to my cycling class the next day and it was just, it's just been a very super delightful experience to do this with, with a community of people. And last night was the fourth one. So we wanted to give everybody some fruit and, you know, I would have just had a big bowl sitting there with apples and bananas in it or something. And they actually had a really nice display <laughs> and they brought cut up fruit. Yeah. And they had, they had hummus out and waters and all these things for people. And, um, there was a really great couple at the end who's, who was fun conversation. So I stayed a little bit later to talk to them and, and, um, they had said something about now is all this fruit okay for blood sugar? Because we've kind of heard that maybe it's not so great. And, uh, another, another employee that was there that was helping me to host the blue zones had said, oh yeah, I mean, we've all heard our doctors say that maybe we shouldn't eat fruit because it'll raise our blood sugar. So we spent a few minutes talking about that little uh, delightful spread of misinformation about the fruits. And I'm able to, you know, look at all the colors here and these colors all represent different nutrients and plant sterols and stanols and, and antioxidants and things that are doing things at the cellular level that is going to support more functioning than just blood sugar. So in fact, being told that fruit or greens or beans or whole grains or anything that we've all been told, and also there's been some awful book written about to slam them, we all can can sit here and, and say it's absolute nonsense to be afraid of the foods that grow from the earth that provide the most cancer-fighting, disease-fighting nutritional value than, than anything else. So, um, anyway, if we sound, if we sound a little passionate today about carbohydrates, it's because we are. <laughs> yeah, we totally are. And you know, it's so, um, you know, you're, you're giving us a little snapshot into this like beautiful experience you're having with this at the community center. And you're right. I love that you made the analogy that you were creating your own little blue zone because, and if any, if, if, you know, anybody listening hasn't heard or seen the, um, read the book, The Blue Zone Diet. Um, the blue zones are areas of the world where they have the longest living um, populations of people. And part of the reason for that is they have uh, many things in common. These zones have many things in common. And one of the reasons that they're, one of the things is community, sense of community. Another is regular activity. Um, another thing is that they have very plant strong, if not plant dominant, if not plant only diets, right? Um, and um, what are the two others? <laughs> like I'm blanking on the other oh, two. Oh, there are so many. I mean, yeah, there's like many, there many, so many. Yeah. Yeah. The, the faith based also purpose. Purpose based. That's um, right. Driven. Mm -hmm, and, purpose -based and, and in that, you know, and so there's a documentary, it's like just recently released documentary on Netflix. So like, check it out. It's definitely a wonderful. And I think it's really cool that your community center is offering this to show the power of community, like how fitting, what a great place to show that. And, um, and here was this simple conversation and there was the fear right there, the fear of fruit. And 
it's such a common experience. You know, we hear from so many people who start with us. And the reality is that, and maybe you kind of remember back in the days when you first started noticing, when you were first making this transition, that in the presence of a high fat diet and with insulin resistance underlying your body, fruit can cause more glucose variability for sure. We know that that is true in those initial kind of days. But one of the cool things is that as you make that shift to a low fat environment or low fat dietary intake, then the carbohydrates don't have the same influence on your glucose, right? So as you're shifting, it's almost like you're, you're, you're shifting from one end of the spectrum to the other, from the high fat to the low fat. And there can be a lot of noise in between that, right? There can be a lot of noise as your body's adjusting to the increased fiber intake, as it's adjusting to the carbohydrate intake. Um, that shift can create some noise, which is where the, f I think the fear really starts to come up. Because all of a sudden, oh, well, I ate that fruit and my blood glucose started going all over. The I started getting higher readings than I've seen before. And this is just too scary. I can't continue. And we've seen and heard our own clients, our own members of our community have those same feelings. And so I, you know, if we're going to talk about where the fear comes from, I think that unfortunately there is an experience of elevation in those initial as, as, as that shift is happening. I don't know if you remember experiencing that yourself or, you know, if you've seen that even with some of your own clients or. It's an, it's two different things. It's, it's always being focused on the short term. That is also something that in, in the, so there's goods and bads when it comes to focusing on the short term, being present, thinking one meal at a time, one insulin sensitizing meal at a time, one hour of exercise at a time. Those are the beautiful ways to look at the short term healthy habits that you can do that will accumulate into the reversal of insulin resistance that we're looking for, or the anti-inflammatory effect that we're looking for, or the weight loss that we're looking for. So in those daily habits is where we get what we, what we want. But then there's also the adjustment phase that happens. And if we're really fixated on our glucose values, when we're at, you know, in the moment where we're still eating high fat foods or we're coming off of, off of years of, of low carbing ourselves, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of maybe three steps forward, one step back, but that's the learning process. And I think that I just, I started to realize how little I ate fruit. I think that was the first thing. Um, I often talk to clients about just take inventory of what you are eating, maybe in animal products. Let's just, no judgment. Let's just look at it all. How often do you throw sour cream on your taco? How much are you putting yogurt on stuff? Um, how much cheese are you sprinkling here, there, and everywhere? Just take assessment and then we'll focus on the foods that you're not eating. They're in the plant world that are insulin sensitizing. So we can start to fill you full of fiber while at the same time, just think about pulling back on the things that were high fat. So that one step at a time kind of, kind of a way to go can be the, the the best way to start shifting our perception with trust in the numbers, with trust in the predictability of what's going to happen, because it is not easy to exit that low carb world when you've been there for a really long time and you're still th scrolling through Instagram and listening to a doctor that doubts you. How many of us, I can tell you, I'll, I'm going to speak behalf on the behalf of the coaches, is how many of us work with clients that are rock in it. Like their anguencies are dropping. They feel good. They're sustaining something that they enjoy. They don't feel like they're dieting. They're really getting the hang of things, but they go to their clinical appointments and their A1C has dropped again, let's say, or it's maintaining at a really healthy space. And their doctor says, you know, I get what you're doing, but maybe you should think about eating more fish. Maybe you should think about the protein. They're still getting it, even though <laughs> they are they are like, like perfect examples of the research that is in the thousands of pages at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Doc. Come yeah. on. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, and yeah, I know. It's so frustrating to hear that happening because then, you know, again, to your, exactly to your point about the doubt, right? Then all of a sudden they're getting doubted. And as soon as those seeds of doubt start to get planted by somebody that we trust, by somebody that we have looked to as a medical advisor, as a health and wellness or medical advisor, when they're planting a seed of doubt in your mind, of course, it, it can start to unravel 
the work that you've already done up to this point. And so to your, you know, like these clients that have already gotten this far, they've started making these changes that are so life sustaining, so life preserving and adding these nutrient rich foods and they're becoming healthier. They're losing the weight that they've been trying to lose or their A1Cs and their cholesterol levels are starting to normalize and getting into healthy ranges and they're getting doubted by their trusted provider. And it's just so frustrating. And that's where another element of, of that it's, it's almost, it's a little different than fear. I think it's a, that all of a sudden it starts to, um, can create some anxiety of like, am I doing the right thing? It's almost like a little bit of existentialism, right? Like, well, what am I doing? Am I supposed to be doing this? My doctor's saying this is not a good idea. So, um, you know, that is, a very real experience. And yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, it's a, it's a source of the, of the fear too. And it never really goes away if you think about it, because the business of nutrition, and I would say the business of nutrition is not the practice. They are very different things. And the business of nutrition is out to, it is not out to make us healthier people. The restaurant business for the most part for the most part, or say the quick service out there, restaurants, what we think of that has a commercial on TV and has a billboard and fast food. And it, these, these companies are not out to make us healthier people. Unfortunately, they don't get pressured to provide health. Um, certainly there are restaurants out there. This isn't like me saying hundred percent of restaurants are out to get us. But when we, th- right, when we think of fast food um, without naming them, I think everyone can realize that we are are saturated in a protein obsessed environment, which is th- the funniest thing about it is it's the nutrient we need the least. It's the macronutrient that we need the least for survival. And that will never change. It's a fact. And the protein is in the foods that you think are carbohydrates, just as much as the carbohydrates that you think are quote unquote bad typically half of those types of carbohydrates, which are cookies, cakes, our pastries, our chips, half of them are made with a half, half cup of butter or oil. So half of your portion is fat as it is, but they're getting slammed as being carbs and unhealthy, which is fair enough. You know, they're added sugars and they're added fats. But when, when we use the word carbohydrate, what I really hope is part of what mastering diabetes does is it, it, it changes the language. And the language is such a big deal in this low carb world we've been in for so long because the language that carbohydrates are not the bad guys, they're actually the good guys when we look at them in the position that they are. And, and by the way, I, I, I can't, I cannot seem to emphasize enough just to healthcare folks that by the way, veggies are carbs, guys, vegetables are carbohydrates. The spinach is a carb. Um, it's the truest form of carbohydrate, actually. There's no added fat there at all. It's the wholest form of carbohydrate, right? And the beans and and the wild rice and these native foods that are so rich and like culturally appropriate and relevant, they're getting slammed as being not good for you. So it just steamrolls into a lot of different things because of that language. Yeah. Such a good point. And, um, and that's why it's so important that we use the phrase whole food carbohydrate when we explain our methodology, which is to eat the foods in our green light category that are so rich in not just carbohydrate energy, but also fiber and minerals and vitamins. They're packed with these nutrient dense, like um, fruits and vegetables are some of the most nutrient dense foods you can put into your body. And so they're restorative. They're offering, you know, these phytochemicals for cellular repair, for cancer fighting or prevention of cancer. I mean, there's just so many amazing benefits to the foods that are in our green light list. And that's what we, you know, are coaching people towards eating more and more and more of. Um, and one thing to kind of point out too, and, and the way that I see it is like every food that you put into your body has some proportion of carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And the way, the reason that that's important is that you're never eating a food in a single macronutrient. Condi- like there's some proportion. Now the proportion may be very close to zero, like as in the case with like animal products, like, you know, a piece of meat is fat and primarily fat and protein and very zero to very, 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 very small amount of carbohydrate. No any. fiber. There's absolutely there's no, fiber no fiber in those. <laughs> 
no fiber for sure. So, right. And so it's funny you say that because I always talk about fiber being, fiber being the fourth macronutrient. And when you look at our meal plans, for example, all of our recipes include fiber on the meal plan so that people can really see just how much fiber they're getting in each meal as well, because it is such an important truly macronutrient, although it's not one of the three that we think of when it comes to our dietary strategies up front. Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, Kylie, with you saying that, yeah, I feel like listeners might have a question. I feel like yeah. a question that might be brewing is, well, hold on a second. How come we've all been taught to eat low carb? Where did it come from? If it's that clear that fiber is a good guy, that all these vegetables are great, we know that, eat fr fruits and veggies, right? But then how come we have all been told if it's type one, type two, or pre-diabetes prevention, why are we still told to eat low carb? Well, that is the question almost circling back to the beginning. We were talking about the fact that there's noise, there's variability. So when you are living in that insulin resistant state, you've developed type two diabetes, you've been eating a higher fat diet, diet, a dietary strategy that's much higher in fat, and you start developing insulin resistance in the background of your body, you come along and eat that one carbohydrate rich food and you're going to get variability in your blood glucose. It's just, unfortunately, that's an inevitability initially. And that variability just scares everybody, <laughs> right? So maybe yeah, the short-term little... thinking, right? It's the short-term thinking. If we start now to your, now like next step of that is like, if we're going to go from the short-term thinking to the long-term thinking, which is, okay, I accept I'm going to have some variability at the beginning of this process. We know there are things that you can do to help minimize the variability. And if you know what those things are, which, you know, there's a number of different tools and strategies that we teach our clients how to reduce some of that variability. But once you break through some of that background insulin resistance, then that's when things get really fun and the fruit becomes a really great strategy and reward for all for what you're doing. And the way that, you know, we've really seen this play out is when we host our retreats. It is, it's not, it doesn't take, I mean, you were trying to talk about long-term strategy. I mean, this takes days. <laughs> like we're not talking super long-term here, right? Um, we've seen people come, you know, some of our clients come to our retreats. We used to host them in person. We'd love to get back to that, by the way, um, you know, that's in the works, but we had to take a break from in-person hosting during, you know, COVID times. Um, but now, um, but we've hosted online and virtual retreats as well. And the outcomes are absolutely remarkable. And it's so awesome to help somebody, to see somebody come into our retreat. They Maybe they have or haven't been already eating a low fat strategy, but it doesn't matter because they come in and on day one, we start them on a green light food. So we feed during our retreats, we actually, well, in-person retreats, we feed our members, you know, the whole time. And it's fruits, tropical fruits, lots of greens. Um, we'll do beans. We'll do some, um, sometimes some potatoes or something like that. But it, you know, the, the menu is very consistent. It's hundred percent green light, no oil, no salt, no sugar. It is very clear. And I mean, people's blood glucose numbers on by day two, three, and four are just plummeting. You know, they're coming down in whether they're living with type two diabetes, type one diabetes, if they're injecting insulin, they're using much less insulin at the end of the search at the end of four days. Like, so you're, you know, we talk about this idea of the thinking in the long term. If, if long term, if four days is long term to you, then, you know, that's okay. Just know that four days will be enough time if you eat a green light strategy for four days straight. And that it's like is the, the all in approach. The, yeah. the all in approach, like, just like, let's just do this. Test it out. I mean, that's yeah. one, one way of going about it for sure. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And you know, some people are okay with that. Like I always, I like to, it's not always the easiest way. That's why having a meal plan, if you can like take a weekend away for yourself, like almost think of it. And I've sort of challenged some of my clients to this in the past where I'm like, could you just take one weekend where you just go and say, you know what? I'm going to pretend like I'm on a retreat. I'm just going to pretend. Like in my home, I have a toddler at, at home. So of course, like we're playing pretend all the time. Like let's pretend to do this. Let's pretend. We're going to take this, make these pretend soup or whatever. Um, so like, let's just pretend for the weekend, like you're on a retreat. Let's pretend that we are feeding you, but I'm just going to give you this meal plan. Follow these meals, eat these exact foods for the next four days straight. Eat as much of them as you want. Don't worry about the volume of food because we want you to be full and satisfied. 
And inevitably, you know, they're t- messaging me. Oh my gosh, I'm needing to adjust my blood glucose or my um, insulin. You know, I have to lower my insulin again. I have to lower my insulin again. Like it's unbelievable how much information you can get about your body if you can go it all in and do this for three or four days in a row. It it becomes very clear that carbohydrates are not the problem. <laughs> yeah, and, I th- and it can be very relevant to have that messaging come on pretty strong if you're that ready to give it a go and you feel super supported. I mean, that's what it's all about, really, is actually being ready to make a huge change, but then finding the right support to to do that. I think that's probably why a lot of the clients here have gravitated in this direction. They know they need the support, they can't do it alone, or they've attempted to, and now they need a little bit more. Um, of an understanding. And I think that's another really smart element of, of fear to kind of address is knowing even, you know, that, that pre-contemplative state of, I know I want to get my A1C down. I know I want to live a fuller life um, at, at any stage, any age, you know, wherever you are, you can make that decision. At, of course, coming off of the blue zones, I'm, I'm thinking like, it's never too late, like ever. I mean, there was a, a guy that told a great story about how he just had a grandchild and he turned 70. And he said, I want to make it at least another 20 years to see that kid graduate high school and go on to college. And that's all it really took for him to have this sort of awakening in himself to, to take more on. But when there's fear about food that constantly gets in the way, I will say that a lot of other things tend to be attached to those fears, food, fear in general, and be ready for that also. Be ready to discover things about your eating habits that you may not have been too aware of in the first place, where it was always trying to avoid carbohydrates, but there may be more behind that. And there are certain things that you can do immediately to start moving into the plant direction towards the insulin sensitive direction, no matter what your pace is. But I know personally, I found that there are attachments to certain foods that you don't know where it comes from, or there is a refusal to eat certain types of carbohydrates because you had a really bad experience in childhood. Tell you the conversation about carbohydrates is a broad topic and being able to answer some of those questions when they come forward is um, part of the the health journey and the awakening of mindset that happens with food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, you know, for sure, there's so many, you know, if, if, and, you know, kind of continuing on that thought about the, these emotional attachments that we have to experiences around food, to, you know, memories of food, to your point, you know, it's, it is very powerful. And, you know, Cyrus always uh, says, he kind of jokes that like, if anybody's like, we're all emotional eaters, right? Like we all eat with some level of emotion, whether it's, we're sitting at the table as a family to have a meal and like, we're enjoying some family time or, or we're unhappy and we're eating, you know, something because we're unhappy, you know, whatever it is, emotions are involved often with the activities of our life in general, right? We could all be emotional exercisers. (laughs) We could all be emotional. Like, you know, it's not just eating. It's all activities of our lives because we are human beings with emotions. And so, but when some of our behaviors in our lives becomes unhealthy or, is triggering us, things are triggering us to do certain things like potentially, for an example, binge eat or binge drink or, you know, use unhealthy coping skills to deal with some of our emotions. That's, you know, a whole other, you know, it's hard to untie those things. It's hard to undo those things and really get reflective of, well, what is the real root here? And how do I take steps away or make changes? And how do I change the behavior that was driven by my emotion? And I think we're going to have to dive into that in our next, the next part of this episode or this, you know, talk, because I, you know, steps to take and ways to start adding carbohydrate in, in a supportive way. If, if the all in approach isn't for you, well, then what, you know, I'm thinking that some people might be thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I do this then? And I think we can address that in the next part of this episode for sure. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Any any other thoughts or anything that also came up? Questions for that listeners might have. <laughs> 
it, I know, you know, the collection of all the things that we kind of jumped through with carbohydrates is that, um, you know, in a very unstructured, unstructured and relaxed conversation about carbohydrates, but <laughs> to talk about that fear and all the other things that are related to it is that it follows a, it follows a theme and the theme is using food for healing. It's, it's the healing tool that nutrition actually is without even digging into the science necessarily, without even getting into um, how intramyocellular fat works and how um, the microbiome works and, and getting into all of the really nitty gritty with science because it's easy to go down and listen to everything you possibly can about the science of, carbo of carbohydrates. However, bottom line is we choose healthy foods, we lean into plants, we start to feel the effect of the healing process and your body will start to talk to your to talk to you in ways that you haven't listened to before perhaps <laughs> and i'm speaking from experience on that one and i don't just mean the fiber bumping around in there because that's certainly a important thing to transition into slowly as well <laughs> true yes that's right <laughs> Yes, physically that is very important. Oh man, we should do a whole episode just on gradually introducing fiber and all the benefits of fiber. We'll have a fiber episode for sure. <laughs> um, just on fiber, you said. Yeah, at some it point. Oh, sorry, did I? Yes, a whole fiber episode. <laughs> is it gonna? Are we gonna gross people out if we start talking about the gift that keeps on giving, which is fiber? <laughs> We'll keep it very safe. <laughs> we'll have safe conversation about it. <laughs> Ungross conversation. Yeah. yeah. Well, you are a nurse and me as a dietitian. It's true. There really isn't anything you can't, yeah, digestive oh, things. We talk about yeah. all that. I'm not, yeah, it's very difficult to gross me out for sure, but we'll, you know, make it listenable <laughs> for people who are listening. Um, speaking of which, if you are listening to this and there's something that we touched on that you want us to talk more about, or you have a question, or you just want to share your story, share your experience with some of the things that we're talking about, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, we love talking with clients, members, non-members, like whoever is listening. Like we want to know who you are. We want to hear from you, please, please, please write into team at masteringdiabetes.org, org, org, org. A lot of people write into the .com version. Don't use .org. Um, <laughs> mastering, a team at masteringdiabetes.org. We, our team will, you know, get your emails to us here and we would love to respond to you, call you out on the pod. Like we, you know, love to share. So um, please feel free to write in anytime. So mm -hmm. and feedback then, is good. Use your voice. Yes. Use yeah, your voice absolutely. if you've got something to say. Totally, totally. Um, great. Well, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and day ahead. And um, as always, we wish you green light choices in your future and uh, keep glowing. <laughs> have a healthy week, everybody. <laughs> Bye.